Blessed be God and blessed are we. Good morning and welcome to worship. I'm Deb Conrad, pastor of Woodside Church. My pronouns are she and her. I'm so glad to be with you this morning in a weekend of national mourning for the loss of Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who died Friday night. I read that Jewish tradition considers especially righteous a person who dies on Rosh Hashanah, and we certainly are thankful for the righteousness and inspiring life of Justice Ginsburg lived in service to a better world. In the most difficult times, it is good to gather, so welcome. If you're new with us today, a special welcome. I hope that you will find refreshment for your spirit here among this community of faith. For all of us, I remind us and invite us to use the comments to greet one another, to reflect on what you may be hearing or experiencing, to think out loud, to offer prayers, people or, or concerns that you know that you would like to lift up in the prayers. When we offer prayers this way, of course we won't say them out loud because this is all pre-recorded, but we will see the names and hold them in our collective consciousness, trusting that God hears from our hearts. And of course, if there is any way that we can be community for you, I hope that you will indicate that in the comments as well, or you can send a private message to me or to our Facebook administrator, one of whom is me, um, and we will respond in whatever ways that we can. Shortly, we will all share a sacred meal, so if you are inclined to participate, you will want to have bread and beverage ready for that in a little bit. Welcome, welcome again, welcome to Woodside, whoever you are. Wherever you are on life's journey, you are welcome at Woodside Church. Now, let's invite God to be among us in our worship. Amen. Amen. Blue star. 
In 1925, an anthology of poems edited by Manuel Gomez was published by the Daily Worker for the Workers' Party of America. It was called Poems for Workers. It was a collection of worker-related poetry from the mid-1800s and later, and included works by Louis Untermeyer and Carl Sandburg, as well as less well-known labor activists and revolutionaries. Today's poem is from that collection. It was written by Jim Waters and is called Statistics. I'm tired of listening to sunshine talk. This pie in the sky stuff, this travesty on patient toil. Let the Jesus screamers, let the open shop artists in their ilk hook their fat necks over a flying emery wheel for eight long, hours, and to the beat and whir of machinery, chant this, I work to get money, to buy food, to get strong, so I can work to get money, to buy food, to get strong. Maybe then they will understand why the church pews are empty and why men die for unionism. Today's scripture reading is from Matthew. The kingdom of heaven is like the owner of an estate who went out at dawn to hire workers for the vineyard. After reaching an agreement with them for the usual daily wage, the owner sent them out to the vineyard. About mid-morning, the owner came out and saw others standing around the marketplace without work and said to them, you go along to my vineyard and I will pay you whatever is fair. At that, they left. Around noon again and in the mid-afternoon, the owner came out and did the same. Finally, going out late in the afternoon, the owner found still others standing around and said to them, Why have you been standing here idle all day? No one has hired, has hired us, they replied. The owner said, You go to my vineyard too. When evening came, the owner said to the overseer, call the workers and give them their pay, but begin with the last group and end with the first. When those hired late in the afternoon came up, they received a full day's pay, and when the first group appeared, they assumed they would get more, yet they all received the same daily wage. Thereupon, they complained to the owner, this last group did only an hour's work but you've put them on the same basis as those who worked a full day in the scorching heat. My friends, said the owner to those who voiced this complaint, I do you no injustice. You agreed on the usual wage, didn't you? Take your pay and go home. I intend to give this worker who was hired last the same pay as you. I'm free to do as I please with my money, aren't I? Or... Are you envious because I am generous? Thus the last 
will be first, and the first will be last. This ends the reading. Joe and Cyrus were best friends. Born about a year apart in Virginia, farm country, 1808-1809. More like brothers, some said, inseparable as it were. They grew up together, they spent their youth and young adulthood doing farm work and likely wishing that the work was easier. So together, as told by reasonable accounts, they invented the mechanical reaper, an early version of what farmers these days would call a combine. The reaper was patented in, 18, patented in 1834. In 1846, Cyrus took the invention to Chicago and founded a manufacturing company that would make it available to farmers all over the Midwest and eventually all over the world. He mingled well, Cyrus did, married off one of his offspring into the Rockefeller family and used those family ties then to leverage more wealth, more political goodwill, more credit and credibility for his business. By the time he died in 1884, his personal worth was about $11 million, or about $300 million today, one of the largest fortunes of the 19th century, according to one writer. The company that he founded, McCormick Works, was eventually run by his son and then by a nephew, and over several generations, many, many family members became multimillionaires. In 1902, McCormick Works became International Harvester, and in 1986 became Navistar International. Today it trades on the New York Stock Exchange for $42 a share. In 2017, its annual revenue was about $8.5 billion. So Cyrus did pretty well for himself. Joe? Joe does not show up in history books. Joe was Joe Anderson, an enslaved black man owned by Cyrus, a gift, in fact, at Cyrus' birth. When Cyrus went to Chicago with his invention that they had created together, Joe was left behind. Cyrus built a tiny cabin for Joe on the farm back in Virginia, and he rented out Cyrus to neighbors for various chores on their own farms and homesteads. Joe's paltry wages, 60 to $70 a year, were paid to Cyrus, and Cyrus would give a small portion then to Joe. Joe disappears from the records about 1888. Presumably, he died around that time. I'm not a market guru, but best I can tell, there are about 77 million shares of Navistar stock held today. If Joe had gotten his half at $42 each, that's about $1.5 billion now. That's money Joe's family did not have, wealth they were not allowed to build. The McCormick family is now prominent in finance, in media, and in real estate. This is what we mean when we talk about stolen labor and the way it echoes through generations. This is the financial legacy of slavery that still hinders black people, black achievement, black wealth accumulation today. This week, a number of things this week, I accepted an invitation to join a new reading group at the, at the moment, a group pondering labor and capital. Coincident, coincidentally, I have also been finishing my eighth book of my reading Sabbath, A Story of Labor and Capital, which is how I knew about the McCormick family. And throughout it all, I've had on my mind two scripture readings this week. In most mainline churches, multiple Bible passages are read in worship on any given Sunday, sometimes as many as four Bible readings, all chosen from a schedule called the Revised Common Lectionary, common because it is shared among almost all the mainline denominations. In most of those churches today, you would have heard both readings that are on my mind. Woodside tends to choose just one reading and then augment that with a poem or an essay from a contemporary writer. We take seriously that God is still speaking and we try to hear what modern prophets have to tell us. After a lot of discussion then this week, our worship team chose one of the passages, Matthew chapter 20, the parable of the laborers in the vineyard, and opted not to read the second passage, the story of the Israelites escaping slavery from Egypt and finding themselves in a desert wilderness with no food. In that story, 
which you may have heard at some point before, the Israelites complain to Moses who intercedes with God and, and manna miraculously rains from heaven. And if you've heard it, you may also know that we tend to call it bread from heaven, a lovely image of what God can do. We even extend the metaphor to tangible daily pleasures in our lives, a parking space clo 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 close to the Kroger entrance, a cash gift for birthday or graduation, a winning lottery ticket, a surprise refund from the IRS, a sweet note from a card or friend. But rarely, rarely, do we say more than that about this story, about the direction the people get from God or the implications of the new community of formerly enslaved people? <clears throat> Our worship committee chose the parable, so I'll go there first, but I cannot leave the manna story just lying there on the cutting room floor. The parable, as you heard just now, is about workers who are hired at various times through the day and the owner of the vineyard who pays them all equally at the end of the day. Matthew associates the equal pay with generosity, which causes some scholars to call the parable by other names, like the humane capitalist or the conscientious boss. There's way too much detail to cover here, but way too little reason to give the boss that kind of credit. The pay he gives them all is in fact not enough for their own needs, much less if they should have a family to support just one fourth of what it takes to get through the day, according to a couple of scholars. So there's no generosity here, which should be a moot point anyway, because workers should not have to depend on generosity. Plus, the owner does nothing to change the reality that they all have to get up the next morning and go to the marketplace and spend all or part of the day hoping and waiting again and again and again, day after day after damn day. Some years ago in Louisville, we at Urban Spirit hosted the Immokalee workers, the tomato harvesters from Immokalee, Florida, who were organizing to force Taco Bell and other fast food companies to pay one extra penny per pound for tomatoes. They talked about what it was like to be day laborers, the job insecurity, the income insecurity their families had to endure. They would wake up in the pre-dawn hours, they said, 3 a.m. or so, and pack their lunches and walk or hitch rides to the labor depot, the marketplace of Matthew's parable. There's almost always a place in a city where folks can show up and hope to get hired for the day. So they would. They had to be there by 4.30 a.m. because that was when the workers were chosen and the buses were loaded to head off to the tomato fields. But not everyone was chosen. And those who were not had to make their way home and try again tomorrow. Substitute teachers we know are a kind of day labor, but at least they get a phone call, you know. Tomato pickers had to prepare for the day even when there would be no day. In the book, the Warmth of Other Suns, about the Great Migration. Isabel Wilkerson tells the story of George Starling, a black man in 1940s Florida, a day laborer who would do the same thing, line up at the designated spot and hope to be chosen to pick citrus all day. 15 cents a box, maybe 10 or $12 a day if they worked hard. Not so unlike tomato pickers in Florida in 2004, paid by the pound and hoping for $25 for the day, backbreaking work six long days a week for less than $8,000 a year. Our poet today, himself a member of the laboring class, shares the mood, the disdain, the exhaustion, the never-endingness of the work. Chant this, he says, I work to get money to buy food to get strong so I can work to get money to buy food to get strong. Anyway, Matthew leads us to think the boss is supposed to be God and we're supposed to be moved by the boss's claim to generosity. Day labor, we see, lies in the competition and all the power lies with the boss. Pickers get chosen for being fast and not causing trouble. And if, if you even start to believe that you matter, just watch how fast you can be replaced. And as George Starling discovered, Find out just how long 40 miles can be when you are not fast enough or not agreeable enough and you are fired midday and have to make your own way home from the fields. And then read the history of McCormick and his determination over nearly a century to pay the workers in his plants by the piece 
on such a convoluted scale that they could never know when they were being cheated or treated fairly. And if they didn't make his quotas, they were fired. And if they exceeded the quotas, then he would just raise the quotas, assuming that he could expect more from them. Which is not unlike my very brief employee as a hotel housekeeper when I was in seminary. Stay late until you finish your list of assigned rooms, but don't finish them early for God's sake, lest tomorrow you get, you get a longer list. The owner of the vineyard then paid them in reverse order, perhaps to keep them mad or jealous or suspicious of one another, perhaps to make the point that no one is indispensable, perhaps as deterrent as one scholar put forth in this alternate title of the parable, how to keep peasants from unionizing. But these laborers are not peasants. According to my favorite scholar of the parables, these laborers are the expendables, fully two classes below peasant. The expendables, and every class system has them, writes Wilkerson, including ours. Friend, said the owner to the one who complained, but friend is no term of affection here. Matthew uses the term rarely and always sarcastically. Friend, get the hell out of my vineyard, he might as well have said, because the worker is being made an example. He is surely not going to be chosen the next day or any other day by this vineyard or by any other vineyard. And without the option of work, the laborer will become an outlaw or a beggar and will die younger than already expected. There's no generosity here. There is only capitalism. Raw, self-absorbed, demeaning, dehumanizing capitalism, which is really the only kind, the kind that would rather watch you die or be evicted during a pandemic than bother to let you stay safely home or subsidize your rent. Said one man in my new reading group this week, I can't think of one good thing that comes from capitalism. I can't really either. The ruling class, wrote one sociologist, purposefully forces a significant number of workers into unemployment as a reserve army to compete with employed workers and drive down wages. There was actually a wealthy Roman landowner before Jesus' day who wrote about just such a system that the property class would use to keep wages depressed. That landowner's name was Cato. No accident, I would think. That is the name chosen by billionaire Charles Koch for the think tank dedicated to pretty much the same principles, the Cato Institute. Capitalism knows that keeping us afraid or suspicious or exhausted or desperate is the way to maintain control, the way to hold power. But you see why we have to read this parable as a, as a story of God's generosity, right? Because the alternative would require something of us that we are not prepared to do, would require us to create an entire economic system based on well-being rather than profit. The Exodus story is better, I guess, bread from heaven, little unexpected surprises that brighten your day, little financial surprises that get you through a tough spot. I won't read you the whole story because it's 30 verses long and Eileen has made it very clear to me that 30 verses is way too many to read in worship, but you can look it up, Exodus chapter 16. The short story is that the people escaped from, who escaped from slavery were heading to the promised land, which was taking longer than they thought. About six weeks into a 40-year journey, they began to complain, sort of like your last family road trip up north or wherever, when your four-year-old lets you get all the way down the block before asking for a snack and wondering if we're there yet. They were hungry, so God arranged manna, which isn't really bread, it's some kind of flaky, powdery frost that appeared in the mornings but melted by midday. And here's what God said, two really important rules for manna. First, go out each day and get enough for everyone in your camp. If you gather too much, you will have enough. If you gather too little, you will have enough because enough is the point. And God was really clear that no one should try to hoard it. This was not an opportunity for entrepreneurs to open bodegas or invent manna cakes with a shelf life of Twinkies or even buy a little extra raw manna to sell to folks who wanted more than enough. Just enough. No one hoards and no one goes without. That's rule one. Rule two is this. 
Everybody gets a day off. There's something about the well-being of human bodies and spirits that you cannot get by working seven, hour, uh, seven days a week. According to this story, you should be able to provide for your family by working, in fact, just half a day. But even if you don't buy my analysis, I want to insist, I want to insist that there is no case, no case to be made for capitalism in this story or in any of the scripture that I can find. If you're looking for religious justification for capitalism, you need a different religion. You need a different set of religious texts. Jim Waters' poem has some harsh words for church. Pie in the sky Jesus screamers, he calls us, and I'm not sure it's unjustified. My reading group this week also expressed a degree of hostility to the church, assigning capitalism's worst ravages to our own worst impulses as people of a particular faith. Even Cyrus, remember Cyrus, our reaper, inventor, and labor thief? He and his family, with their hundreds of millions of dollars gleaned from the shared idea of a man their ancestor enslaved, they are Christian. They are Presbyterian, in fact, not unlike the current occupant of the White House. Cyrus Money founded, Cyrus Money founded McCormick Theological Seminary in Chicago. McCormick Seminary, named for Cyrus. The pro-worker left is hostile to the church and not just to the Presbyterians. And do we even bother to wonder why that is? It's not about Jesus one way or the other, though maybe it is about the Jesus we have created in our own minds. And maybe Matthew is the worst with the way he spiritualizes everything. Matthew says this is, this is a parable about generosity, about last being first and giving us an opening to turn it into a competition for seats in heaven, letting us imagine it's about people living debauched lives but getting to heaven right along with people who lived righteous lives all along, which mostly annoys us. That's pretty unfair, we think. I bet if we took a poll the single most preached interpretation of this parable would be exactly that. Deathbed conversions, and they get the good stuff. And Matthew is okay with that. But Jesus was an economics kind of guy. Every story we have about Jesus, in some way or other, is telling us there is a better way to live lives of wholeness, of shalom, which certainly includes food and shelter and dignity and art and music and leisure and health care and child care and meaning and Sabbath. If you work all day and still only come home with one-fourth of what it takes to meet your basic needs, your boss is not generous and your system is wrong. Not broken, this system, because it's functioning the way it was intended, but it is wrong. It is just wrong. And if we are people of Jesus' way, as we say we are, then we have a responsibility to say so out loud and try to make it different. And clergy also need to say so, even when they call us communists or socialists or anarchists or radicals. We hold up the system. Churches and clergy hold up the system. We do it when we insist that Matthew is only about generosity in a non-competitive heaven, and when we insist that manna from heaven is about little daily surprises. I don't know where this world is heading. We have a fascist president who wants very badly to be a dictator. We have a majority party that's all too happy to accommodate him, a minority party that believes tweaking the system is really all we need to do. Corporations run by multi-billionaires who somehow think more money will make their lives complete and don't care where it comes from or at what cost to people or the planet or their own integrity. An election is coming up and voter suppression and election tampering are all the rage. The U.S. Postal Service, effectively delivering things to every single person in the country since 1775, is being hampered in its ability to deliver ballots, and now we're learning it was prohibited from delivering masks in the early weeks of coronavirus when those masks could have saved tens of thousands of lives. So under the glare of capitalist economy, led by folks who tend only to the thinnest veil of democracy, the twin viruses of white supremacy and COVID-19 take more lives every day Plus, somebody still owes the descendants of Joe Anderson half the value of Navistar and lots more to lots of other descendants who have been debilitated for generations by the theft of labor and ideas and capital and humanness. 
And now, Ruth Bader Ginsburg is dead, and a nation mourns, and we wonder what's to become of us. While Mitch McConnell is rubbing his hands together in glee, and solutions seem even further away, I don't know where this ends. I just don't. Corey posted on Facebook Friday night, we're not far as a nation from our last gasp before the plunge into peak crazy. And he may be right. More than perhaps ever, humankind needs clear-headed people of faith willing to call out the damage that we do to reject the conventional wisdom that leaves some people holding everything and most people clinging to sorely diminished lives. We need people who will reject the conventional faith that has lied to us about Jesus, that has led, the church, has, has led us to believe the church is always right, a church that has claimed for itself an, an eternal exemption from the rules about hoarding and exploiting. Jesus told us the story of a vineyard owner, maybe to give us a heads up, to remind us what we're up against. And Exodus gave us a story about food and rest and how there's enough to go around. And I believe that just those two stories tell us the whole story of Scripture. If we had no Scripture but those two stories, I believe our faith would flourish. Nikki Finney is chair of Southern Letters and Creative Writing at the University of South Carolina, and she writes poetry rooted in her black ancestry in slavery in the South Carolina Sea Islands. Among her works is a poem called Woman Holding Up All These Folks, which begins like this. Whenever they have come to take us by blade, shotgun shell, rope, or induced sickness, there's always still more of us to go around. We never run out of each other. There's always more of ourselves, more, still more where we come from. I don't know where Miss Finney gets her hope all these generations later, but I'm thankful for it. And I will feast on it even as I feast on the sacred remembrance of Jesus the Radical. We will feast together on hope, on community, on Jesus' life, on the imagination of God, and the power of a spirit we cannot tame. We will repent the church's complicity in the destruction and commit ourselves to a new day. We will work for a new day and we will never run out of each other. It is enough. If we do it right, it is enough. Amen. This land is your land, this land is my land From California to New York Island From the Redwood Forest to the Gulf Stream waters This land was made for you and me As I was walking that ribbon of highway I saw above me that endless skyway I saw below me that golden valley This land was made for you and me I've roamed and rambled And I've followed my footsteps To the sparkling sands of her diamond desert and all around me a voice was sounding This land was made for you and me As I went walking I saw a sign there And on the sign it said no trespassing But on the other side it didn't say nothing that side was made for you and me In the squares of the city In the shadow of the steeple By the welfare office I saw my people As they stood there hungry I stood there asking 
Is this land made for you and me? Nobody living can ever stop me As I go walking that freedom highway Nobody living can ever make me turn back This land was made for you and me Let us who journey on the way with Jesus, risen and ever-present, pray for the world with all our hearts and minds, saying, God of, God of our, our journey, journey receive, receive our, our prayers. prayers. For all nations and people of this wide earth, that we may be delivered from the oppression we bear and the oppression we impose on others, and from false hopes and futile ways. God, God of, of our, our journey, journey receive, receive our, our prayer. prayer. For all in the world who care for the sick, the dying, the hungry, and the destitute, even when it puts them in the path of death. God, God of our, our journey, journey, receive our, our prayer. prayer. For the hungry, the homeless, those who are denied dignity, and those who have no hope, that human compassion will improve their condition, and that national compassion will remove the causes of their suffering. God, God of, of our journey, journey receive, receive our, our prayer. prayer. For the earth itself, that all people may respect its resources, preserve and work for its future, and enjoy its fruits. God, God of, of our journey, journey receive, receive our, our prayer. prayer. For our beloved community, that we may increase our outreach and increase our compassion. Show us those we do not see. God, God of, of our, our journey, journey receive, receive our, our prayer. prayer. For all in any pain and for all who sorrow those who are known only to you, and those we now name. Bring them beyond their troubles into your peace. God, God of our, our journey, journey, receive our, our prayer. prayer. Call us with the voice we know, and give us grace to listen. Amen. Amen. Hello, my name is Jamie Schmidt, and my husband and I are members of Woodside Church, along with our son. We have been attending for about three and a half years. Woodside Church uh, became a possibility for us after we had walked away from the church that we were attending, kind of with our hands up in the air, and I was at a place where I wasn't sure church was where I wanted to be anymore. I didn't feel church and Jesus connected. I didn't feel the Jesus that I felt and that I heard talk to me and talk through me was the same Jesus that I heard talked about to me. And so I walked away and I wasn't sure I was going back. And a friend came to us and said, listen, I've gone a couple of times and there's something about this church. Try it. So Adam and I did, and that was three and a half years ago. And we realized that we had found a place that didn't have all the answers, that didn't profess to have all the answers, but offered us a glimpse of what Jesus can do with a whole bunch of people who want to be their best and want to use their tools and want to say, oh, <laughs> I just screwed that up. How can I fix it? How can I do that better next time? How should I have done this differently? How can I be an ally? How can I be a support? What rally can I attend? Uh, how can I get the vote out? How can I let people know that everyone is loved? Jesus doesn't put us in boxes. And as a parent, that was particularly appealing to me because as my son grows, I realize, I knew, but I realize more and more that he has everything laying before him as every mother wants for their son. And I want him to be able to move mountains and I believe he can, but I never want him to forget that part of the reason 
this will be easy for him is because he was born into a middle-class white family that he had no choice in. He did nothing to start the privilege that he has that will get him places that he can go. Now, I want him to be able to go those places, but I want him to use his voice along the way and when he's there, and I want him to bring people with him. And Woodside has allowed me to be able to put that into a complete coherent thought and realize, yeah, that's good. And yeah, that can be done. And there are people around us that can answer questions that you have about that or share experiences or have no idea but go through it with you. So Woodside to me is a community. It is acceptance of everyone and it's family. And I know everybody says, we're a family, but it's not necessarily the kind of family you're gonna sit down and have Thanksgiving dinner with, but it's the people I think of when I have a tough question that I need guidance with, or I just had this great experience and I said the right thing at the right time in a group and I wanna share it. So Woodside has been a blessing for my family and for many families and for the community. If this sounds like something that you would like more information about or you would like to join us, not in seats at this point, but still, we are together at all times, please check out woodsidechurch.net. Um, there's an opportunity to share funds if you can do that or request more information or both. And if you're watching this and you wonder if you're loved, you are by a whole lot of people. And Woodside Church is living proof of that. So please, join us just so you can feel validated and loved. Thank you very much. Now we have come to the time of a holy meal. Our time is not unlike other times. There are people in the streets demanding to be heard, rebelling against a broken system, struggling under the weight of empire, feeling stuck. It has been thus for our whole history as a nation, even when we didn't see it. And it was thus during the time of Jesus' life among his friends. Oppression, defiance, disruption, refusal to meet the moment with the kind of homage that the empire demanded. And just when it was about to hit fever pitch, just when the authorities had decided they couldn't take any more, just when the, dis the dissident disciples decided they couldn't take any more, just when Jesus knew it was all about to boil over, he gathered with his friends for a meal. They laughed and talked and planned. They compared notes and ideas. They perhaps sang songs of resistance or wrote the phone number of a lawyer somewhere discreetly on their bodies. 
And then, as the meal was ending, Jesus said, just one more bite, this time for remembering, just one more sip, this time as a ritual of remembering. He broke bread. He poured wine. He passed the plate, he passed the cup, and he said, do this. How, however awful it is about to get, do this, and remember that I am with you. They did, and we do. With gratitude, we remember. That night will be ugly, we know, but day will dawn, and we will remain in holy community, caring for one another, doing our best to keep one another safe, sharing memories, and maybe plotting and planning. We will be community, just as Jesus said, and in the meal, in the eating, in the drinking, there is love. Let us pray. God of revolution and grace, pour your spirit on these gifts of bread and wine. Let them be for us strength for the way, light for the road, hope for a new day. And let us be exactly those things for your world in pain. Amen. Now the meal is ready. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Let us pray. Now, O oh God, we give thanks for this meal and ask that you would bless us on our way, our bodies as the body of Jesus, our community as your community of grace. In your sweet name we pray, amen. I thank you again for joining us today. We will hold one another close and get through these times. After worship, we have coffee together, coffee fellowship, and there's a Zoom link in the comments that I hope you will use to join in the conversation for a little while. This week, we will start a new Bible study as well on Thursday evenings. We'll begin with an introduction to scripture, a book by Marcus Borg. We haven't read Borg in a while, so we're gonna read uh, reading scripture again, reading the Bible again for the first time. Um, as kind of a foundation for then delving into various books of the Bible that appeal to whoever shows up to want to talk. So look for that. Our calendar should be up to date. Woodside World came out this week. And if you haven't gotten a copy of that, let us know in the office. Let us get you on the list. Use the app to get announcements right to your phone. Um, the, the, the announcement slides that we scroll and worship at the very beginning each week um, you can follow along with those. If there's anything you'd like to announce, get it to Hunter in the church office by noon on Wednesday, and we will make sure to have it in the Sunday morning announcements. If there's anything you need, if there's a way that we can be community, please, please let us know. And now have a blessed week as we join in the benediction. God bless us and keep us. God's face shine on us and be gracious to us. God look upon us with favor and give us peace. Amen. Amen.